Hello, welcome or welcome back to hear from another fantastic guest on the Instec London podcast. Eric Abrahamson is CEO and founder of Digital Fine Print or DFP and one of the most well-known figures in the London insurtech world from the last few years. In this episode, Eric not only explains what the company does, but he's got some great tips if you're looking to build a company, hire staff, pitch to insurers, and a whole lot more. Now, the other great news is that you can listen to this whether you are walking, running, driving, or whatever else you get up to whilst you're listening to our podcast, but you don't need to worry about missing out on these great insights. We're now providing you an easy-to-read summary of our podcast, and these are also, by the way, a great way to share what you've heard with other people that may not yet have discovered the joy of podcasts. I caught up with Eric in the DFP office in London. Eric, delighted to have you for the Instead London podcast. We've known each other quite a few years. In fact, we actually met in Lloyd's when you were sitting there about to pitch your business. And here we are three years further on. You've got a a wonderful business game. So, Believe me. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, now, you, you started off with you, your early stage of your career. You were an analyst at Procter & Gamble. You then went on to work at Twitter. Today, Digital Fine Print has got a mission to protect small businesses yep. by, you said on your website, equipping, empowering, and enabling the insurance industry with the right tools to generate actionable SMP insights. So look forward to talking about that in a minute. Um, according to Crunchbase, you raised just over $7 million Dollars most recent round was uh, end end of last year. Last time I was in your office, you had a sauna in here. I think we're actually sitting in the sauna, even though the sauna is not actually here anymore. Exactly, it used to be. What we call the sauna was actually a garden shed because back in the early days of the business, we needed some place to take uh, meetings, but if we didn't want to or couldn't afford to build a proper meeting room. So we actually bought a garden shed on Walton's online, and then we took that garden shed and put some soundproofing materials in and used it as a meeting room for, for almost a year. Um, now with new funding, we actually built a proper meeting room. It's the one we're sitting in right now, uh, but we still call it the sauna because it does get hot in here sometimes. Um, it's uh, almost that I miss it sometimes, the early days of the business, but also we're becoming more professional as a company going forward and asking uh, both investors and lawyers and insurance professionals sit in the floor of a garden shed on beanbags. It's not just professional enough, so we are growing up as a company as one example of it. Well, I guess it's a sign when you go from a startup to a scale-up, you, you dismantle your garden shed and you build yourself a real office, but please, exactly. don't, please don't get too, uh, too serious <laughs> and too corporate. Of course not. Um, so uh, there seems to be a theme of people who started up really interesting companies that they've had jobs outside of insurance in industry that in themselves are pretty interesting, uh, but then found the sort of insurance is where they wanted to build their career. Sure. So what, what, what took you from working at an organization like Twitter, that I'm sure was fascinating, into, into insurance? Twitter was amazing, and I definitely buy into the mission that Twitter has about giving a voice to every person on the planet. Uh, amazing people being part of the Singapore office made us feel that we were part of something big and meaningful across Southeast Asia. Um, I was very lucky enough to win a scholarship to Oxford. It was my fourth application, so I've been rejected many times. And when that came in, I suddenly had the opportunity to come back to the UK, which was close to my heart, um, and fulfill a dream of, of studying there. It also meant that the savings I'd put away uh, to do a master's eventually was something I could invest in a business. And then the question became, what kind of business should I start? So I started looking very quantitatively, what industries do I think will see massive amounts of digital transformation? Where are the biggest opportunities to have an impact? And that turned out to be insurance. Um, in fact, I even wrote my dissertation on lessons from fintech, so banking transformation, that could be applied in insurance. 2016 was really the beginning of InsureTech, and that's when I founded DFP. And I think that the kind of ecosystems that you and Robin Paolo have built up were really the beginning of that journey. So thanks to your great job, thanks to the investment, we've really seen a rising wave of insure tech in the past couple of years. So it started with an idea of where could we apply new technologies, um, new types of big data and AI, and it became digital fine print, it became insurance. So you're right, it's often that you come from a different industry, maybe you look at things a bit differently with new pair of eyes. But then you also want to bring in experts. That's why I'm so happy to have people on the team from AIG and RSA, QBE, uh, Tokyo Marine, and so on. Can we just talk a little bit about the business and more specifically, sure. what does that actually mean when you talk about transforming the way insurance professionals serve the, the SME market? Of course, we want to provide the best data asset, data platform about SMEs. 
And we've built that by being able to start with the basic government data, but then linking it to website data, social media data, data on properties, website, cyber, everything you need to be able to serve and protect a small business. And we sell that to insurance carriers for underwriting insights, growth opportunities, um, efficiencies, because our data assets are both uh, cheaper, more accessible and easier to use than other ones that are out in the market. And when we can bring those insights, when we can show what risks are facing an SME, then the insurance industry can do what it does best, providing the cover and the security to help more SMEs grow. You're dealing with data that I think for the large part is accessible either you go out into the web or you can license it, but how do you therefore differentiate what you're doing sure. versus other people that can also get access to the data? Yeah, you're right. The open data is the first step that we get to, but we also acquire proprietary data sets and we build our own predictions and our own data sets, for example, around cyber risk, website quality, anything related to director's risk and other areas which are proprietary to DFP. But then it's also about making the data accessible and usable and proving that we can have a positive impact and positive ROI. The fact that we've been working with QBE now since starting in 2017 uh, proves that they've seen massive value in working with us. So it's both about building the product, but then also having the commercial capacity and execution ability to turn the data, just as a raw format, into something that's actionable. You were talking about getting access to or using LinkedIn data as a way of profiling companies. Is that still one of the sources you use? LinkedIn is really interesting and it's really now a relevant one. Recently there was a court case in San Francisco where LinkedIn had previously tried to have their own walled garden and close off access to a lot of the publicly available data that's accessible on LinkedIn. But in that court case, they were actually forced to open up more access. So we're seeing more of that data asset being um, used. I think that the industry is always on a development journey. Now it's becoming standard to use, for example, companies' house data, but very few insurers are using the kind of web scraping data that we have access to, um, or data about directors or cyber. LinkedIn is the next part of that frontier, and the frontiers of what's possible will always increase, so we want to be at the very forefront of having the most relevant, actionable, latest data to be able to create a competitive advantage for our customers. And what about the difference between, picking up on that, between the US and UK or Europe? Do you sure. have material differences in terms of data you can get access to mm-hmm. in both countries? In the US you can profile individuals much, much more than what you can on the GDPR here in, in Europe. Um, that's one of the reasons that we went for SME, because in the European context you can profile businesses. It is very difficult, and rightly so, to profile individuals. That's one of the key ones. Uh, There are other data providers in the US who do similar things to what we do, but on personal lines. They'll be very difficult, both legally and ethically, to do in Europe. Okay, great. So just talking about your clients, so you've got a number of people you've publicly announced. I'm sure you've got some more as well behind the scenes, including RSA, Hiscox, Hula Hermes, QBE. Uh, So congratulations on that. It feels like you're now getting past that technology adoption curve, the, the, uh, getting through the chasm and actually now getting some real momentum out there, which is difficult for a lot of people. When you go into a company, who are, who are the typical people that you're engaging with and, and buying from? Is that through the innovation group or is it through underwriting or combination of both? Sure. It depends on the key business objective. And we find that uh, insurers come to us to solve one of three challenges, insurers and brokers um, come to us. It's either about growth growing GWP, finding and getting access to a new sub-segment of commercial customers that they haven't been able to serve before, and we can provide insights about them to figure out their risk needs. It can also be about underwriting. That was the case with uh, Euro Hermes, for example. Finding a new source of underwriting data to have an edge when it comes to pricing, for example, and that's a key uh, inflection point for them to be able to take their companies to the next level and optimize loss ratios. Third one is about efficiency being able to give access to their uh, data science analytics teams to new sources of insight and data faster and cheaper than what other providers can do. So depending on those three, we talk to different people. Often it's a head of distribution, head of broker relations, it's actually very relevant for the carriers themselves. Um, It can be anything related to ops efficiency and just frankly being able to be more efficient in their spend on data. Insurers are spending so much but they're not getting the right value and that's where we can help. Or of course if it's around underwriting insights, we often talk to the chief underwriting officer. In the case of QBE, I did an uh, amazing uh, conference presentation with uh, one of their 
Heads Marketing with Christopher Ward, where we were standing and explaining the work we've been doing over the past few years. So that's one example of a great partnership that's now been going on for quite some time, and you start seeing great ROI for them to be going through with that. Yeah, it's always tremendous when insurance companies are comfortable to talk about who they're partnering with. I know in some cases, at such an early stage, that the legal team is very reluctant to talk about who an insurance company is working with. I guess they just don't want to be exposed if it's a failure. Uh, you know, DFP now is very well known. You're often cited as, as one of the companies that has been successful. You've got very good visibility in there. But what, what's your advice to other people who are a bit earlier and trying to get access to these companies? Is, well, what's the most effective way for them to get their, their message out and talk to people who could ultimately be the buyers? It's a good question. I think it comes down to uh, building the personal relationships with other people in the industry. That's where I think Instech London is such an important ecosystem to provide a meeting place for those interactions to happen. It might be that the people you meet there are not the right ones to talk to immediately, but they probably know it in a second tier. So it's the idea that you are probably second level connected to every person that could be a good influencer uh, or buyer or, or a user of your technology. The question is only how to get there. And I have to put my hand up and say, I don't think I was very good at that in the beginning because I wasn't connected to anyone in the insurance industry. The very first thing I did once I decided to start DFP was to organize my own conference. I called it the Oxford InsurTech Symposium and uh, one of my professors helped out and we made ourselves the mutual co-chairs and had a lot of fun with that. Um, but then we got 50 people to travel from London to come to Oxford and talk about innovation. Many of those people became some of the most fervent supporters and investors in DFP. So being able to start to create those meeting places this is where you start from, from day one, then you try to expand that and deepen the relationships. There are some people who think that you can run also a virtual business and, and, and be a digital nomad. I don't think that works in InsurTech specifically. It's still a person-to-person -person business. You have to be able to sit next to each other. Um, that's why we're in central London. We need to be next to our customers and users and have, find the best talent. So it's about delivering that kind of person-to-person. -person. Um, and I'm backing that up with a social media strategy from my Twitter days, figuring out how to have a strong brand from my Procter & Gamble days. It's all about working holistically to allow those relationships to, to flourish. No, well, well, congratulations to all that. I said every time I bump into you, I seem to see you a lot. You're always looking very upbeat and happy, so you certainly got to... That's my job, right? <laughs> it's my job to be the optimistic face for the business, yeah. no matter how it's actually going, because you have to be keeping things moving forward every single time. Top, 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 tips, being, top, top tips of being a successful CEO is to uh, yeah, look optimistic. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, accelerators, particularly, first of all, the Lloyds Labs. So yeah. you were on the last cohort. That's right. Uh, yeah. Spoke spoken to quite a few people in there, spoke to Trevor Maynard. How, how did you find that for, for the business? Yeah, Lloyds Labs was a massive eye-opener for us because despite the fact we've been in InsurTech uh, in the past three years, uh, we have never actually interacted in a meaningful way with the Lloyds market itself. It is very different from retail, SME, personal lines and the rest of it. Much more specialised, much more professionalised, um, more traditional. So there's so much more you need to be learning. Lloyds Lab provides a number of those meeting places for us to interact and learn much, much more, which has impacted both our product development roadmap and gotten us new business opportunities, both with the market as a whole and with the syndicates and also brokers. It was also great to see some other outstanding startups in as part of the lab, for example, Floodflash. They're also backed by Pentec Ventures. Uh, I'm a big fan of Ed Klinger at Flock. He was also part of the same cohort. So being able to see them succeed within the lab itself is great and being able to work side to side is really helpful. Um, and just as a practical point, having it in central London, being able to use that as a space to go out and meet others definitely helps. We've been part of other accelerators before. Some are more generalist, others are more focused. And um, the best ones I always find are the ones where you have a specific goal when you enter the accelerator and you're able to achieve it. And with both uh, Accenture that we did earlier and also Lois Lab, I definitely felt like we got that. And, and so on to that point, so for people looking at what the different accelerators offer, what's the best way to look at all of the different organizations out there and identify sure. the different, uh, how, how did you sort of filter the ones that you wanted to go to versus yeah. the ones that were so good? It differed a lot from the stage of the company we were at. The very first accelerator we did was with uh, Allianz. It was down in southern France, so great, amazing place to be at. So I recommend the Allianz Accelerator to everybody who wants to enjoy this in the summer. Um, they are amazing at teaching you the basics of insurance. It's very early stage ideation, figuring out what your proposition should be. That would not be very applicable to DFP as it is today because we're so much more established. So therefore, an early stage accelerate like that is probably the best for people who have just started, maybe attract a little bit of investment. 
Then you have sort of mid-stage, seed-stage accelerators like uh, Accenture. Um, they require you to have customers and funding before you can enter. And we were very lucky enough to, to get the funding in place. Uh, was that Q4 2016 to be able to enter in Q1 uh, 2017? That was a fundamentally uh, transformative experience for DFP. We professionalized, we started doing B2B sales, we'd never known anything about it before. Um, and that was a clear momentum gathering exercise for the business. Then there are others who are more specialized. Uh, plug and play, great for international expansion. Lois Lab, as I mentioned here, for, for insurance specifically. Um, and then there are some that are run by uh, specific organizations which you might want to get to know better. MetLife is one example where we did an accelerator in Singapore to learn more about the Asian opportunity um, and also about life insurance specifically. So you learn something from a, uh, every single accelerator. Sometimes you realize that actually this is not a good fit for the product that we are offering. That's really valuable to get inside of an accelerator itself because unless you give up a lot of equity, uh, it's effectively free learning for you and meeting people are coming to you with advice and mentorship. So to summarize, it's about finding the one that's a good fit for the stage you're at and, and the product that you have. And on that last point about the equity, at one, one point, quite a few of the accelerators were actually requiring yeah. equity to take part. It's yeah. less, less the trend these days. A little bit. I think that makes sense for early stage businesses because you have nothing else to pay, right? And frankly, you might not even afford to be going through. Um, so it, it kind of depends where, where you're at in your development cycle. The earlier you are, the more likely it is that you, you should um, invest some of your equity in a good accelerator. Um, in our case, I guess we invested more of our equity in the team, so we set up a very sizable options pool when I compare it to, to other startups. People who join from other startups say that ours is twice as big um, than in other ones. So just putting it out there, we're hiring and there's more options to be giving out to others, so uh, if somebody's interested, do drop me a line. Yeah, and great office for anybody listening. So, uh, Thank you. And, and as well as the Next to Borough Market, great Borough Market lunch all about that flat yeah. square around the corner. A good company, a great boss. Uh, so that's a nice, nice uh, segue into your highlights of 2019. Yeah. Uh, so you talked a bit about recruitment in that. You yes. started bringing some people, as I said, you started bringing some people in from industry. Exactly. How do you go about finding those people? Because a lot of them are leaving secure jobs, yes. well paid. You mentioned the options pool, but it's still quite a big risk and it's different again yes. as it were for a, a smaller company. It probably was a bigger risk in the very beginning because in the very early days, if you have a few hundred thousand in, in investment, you're probably working at about the one year, maybe 18 months of, of runway. Later, when you have a few million investment as we have, um, along with sizable revenues, then you de-risk a little bit about the cash flow. So you know that you're going to be able to actually pay you know, a salary, which is nice to be able to have for the longer foreseeable future. In addition, if you can combine it with a big option pool, and by the way, now I'm very glad I set up a big option pool in the beginning, it would be difficult to replicate that today. Therefore, we're able to compensate both with sizable salaries, but also with, with options. I do think that in the beginning of a startup, it's valuable to have more generalist uh, people, generalist managers. I put myself in that category. Later, you need to find some specialists, people who know the industry, who can bring relationships, can bring a proven way of working, and be able to be executing at a much, much faster pace because that's the true scaling up that happens. So now we're in that period where we're hiring people from QBE, Tokyo Marine, uh, AIG, Oracle, the real leaders of the industry are coming to DFP. And what they tell me is that they're coming over uh, both because they want a new challenge, because they want that excitement of running something. And frankly, here, compared to their old organizations, they all say that there's no waiting period. There's no, let's go to X committee and see if we get funding for this. No, we make a decision, we execute it the same day. Tomorrow is long term, we need to do it now. That's the only way that we can grow as fast as we want to grow. So that's the key difference to get that opportunity of actually impacting. Uh, I'm sure a question that anybody who's listening would, would be asking as well is when it comes to how much you can pay people, how competitive can you be that you've got funding now, sure. you've got some funds, but how competitive can you be for people coming in from from industry yeah. salary? That, that's a good question and it's a choice and I see entrepreneurs making the choice often to have a big team with lots of headcount and be able to say that I run a 50 person business and in theory we could do that as well. We're choosing not to. We'd rather have um, 25, 30 outstanding A players, the best we can get and we're willing to pay to attract that top talent. So we're actually making that choice to invest more in the people we've identified. We have exacting demands on, on interviews. We, uh, we hired one in 10 people who, who went through interview last year. So we're being extremely selective when it comes to finding the right people, but then we also compensate them well. So in terms of you, you had your highlights of 2019, one of the highlights we touched on earlier on, but maybe there's some more things in there that are worth sure. talking about is 
you get access to more data and better data. Is there any sort of stronger data sets coming through that you feel particularly pleased to have been able to access? Quite a few. I can't tell too much about them, then it wouldn't be a proprietary secret anymore. We talked about LinkedIn, we talked about uh, property data. We've never been able to serve property and commercial insurance before. Uh, cyber is growing like crazy and we all see it. But I think that the key is to realize that when we add a new data source, it creates a better experience for every user of our platform. So when we are finding something new and valuable, we bring it to all of our customers and then you're able to be creating a viewpoint that's much stronger. So the insights are always becoming more valuable. Um, some people would argue that eventually it's going to lead to commoditization in SME insurance. I think that's 10, 15 years away. It's more about now giving the real basic details and insights about an SME before it happens. Great. Well, we look forward to hearing more about the data as it evolves. But you, you mentioned there in passing platforms, and one thing we haven't talked about is how, how do people actually use your products? Do they sure. have to license a separate DFP platform, or can you plug into some of the other sure. proprietary platforms out there? It's a great question, and often it becomes a big discussion uh, within the company. Do we try and go by ourselves, or do we try and access uh, other platforms more if we can? And we want to be part of the biggest and the most actionable platforms for the industry. One of those happens to be Salesforce. So we have actually already launched on the App Exchange. Uh, Salesforce gave us some amazing development support um, as part of what's called the FinServe program. Every year they've tried to find the top 10 fintechs in EMEA. And we were honored to be selected and get the support to launch on the App Exchange uh, last year. Apart from those ones, we are also working uh, with DXC as part of the reseller agreement. We're looking for other platforms to plug ourselves into. Other than that, you can also access our data through API. It's probably the most common. Um, we're also a native AWS app, and we use things like Quick Sites to be able to visualize the data, get dashboards to come up, which are much more flexible than if we would try and build our own dashboards from scratch. So by using those existing tools out in the market, it's making it easier as an entrepreneur to be able to get to market faster. And it's also better for the customer because they can keep using the kind of Power BI tools or visualization tools that they're used to. 10, 20 years ago, if you were starting a company like TFP, I can't imagine what you need to do in terms of getting your own server set up, getting everything built from scratch, but now you can use native tools that are cheap, and then we can package the data and focus on making the best data asset the world has ever seen. So that's why I'm so excited about it, that we can focus on the best parts in our true value app, and then use the platforms like Salesforce to be able to take it to market. One other question on the platform side is, the actual you becoming a platform for other organizations' data. So, do you see the future? You will be talking to some of the other you know, early stage companies and sure techs and actually offering them a way to market for their, for their data. Potentially, we see a couple of really interesting ones out there uh, Broker Insights, uh, there are others like uh, Hyper Exponential, there are others who are trying to create niche data sets that we think that we can be a valuable partner to be bringing that to market as we have now proven that we can be distributing it. That's also a long ways away. Um, the question that we keep debating is, will insurers want to buy point solutions, so specialized data assets from different places, or do they want to go to a single provider and have a single API for the whole needs? Personally, I think the answer lies in the budget control. Whoever is head of SME distribution will have a certain budget to provide data to their underwriters and distribution teams. And we want to be the provider to solve the problem for that person. It's very difficult to try and get many people within an insurance company to agree on this is a single data provider for personal lines, commercial lines, marine, aviation. That's not going to work. So you need to be niche, but you need to be niche that's linked up to the budget owner, frankly. So to answer your question, definitely, if we find high value add um, data sources that we can be adding in. So if anybody's listening and have a great idea for what we can be adding in, come and talk to me and we can see how we can work together. That point in there about the insurance companies and actually multiple buyers and insurance companies is something that people often don't realize. They tend to see one organization talking through the lens of one person. Of course, yeah. as you all know, you know, large, complicated organizations everywhere have got different people, different budgets, different sure. ways of engaging. So your point about you know, you've got to find different people to be able to sell to. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's a lot. I think it's really, really important. I've been listening to hear your thoughts on that from the time at RMS because you know much more about this than I do. Um, I'm new in the industry. What was it like there? Was it finding the niche solutions or being the single provider? Well, I think initially it has to be a, every product or solution has to solve a business problem. Yeah. Sort of, you know, everyone's saying that, but it's, it doesn't, it's still very, very true. And people really need to feel a burning urgency to solve that problem. Yeah. So 
part of it is just finding the problem and then I think the second bit is actually who in that organisation really wants to make it work and, and I, the people that are successful find that I always call them internal sales people who, who really want to make the person they're buying from successful and so the, the conversation moves from you know John I've got to convince you to go and buy my product to John I've got to go and help you make the case to go and sell it internally and so it's a very it's, it's a subtle but it's a very important shift of mindset that people often don't really understand and I think sometimes that's, as you say, sometimes it's point by point, sometimes it's doing across a whole platform, but it's the risk of trying to offer too much and just confuse what the, the key message is and lose sight of that. Actually, you know, that is the real problem. And you talked about your know, cyber earlier on. There's, there's, you know, as we all know, there's a big opportunity in cyber, but it's not quite that burning issue yes. yet because there hasn't been a big catastrophic loss. Well, Harry, we covered a lot and you've got a lot going on, but is there anything we haven't covered, anything that's happening you think is important to share at this point? I think uh, from us, it's really going to be an exciting year. 2020 is a new decade and we're growing in all cylinders, expanding the team, finding new partners, finding new data assets and so on. So it's really exciting and we're part to be part of it. But I think that's also mirrored in the wider insurtech ecosystem. We see more and more funding every year. We see some real challengers like Next Lemonade and others. And that's exciting to see how they're going to interact with uh, the standard uh, insurance industry. We see ourselves as an enabler of the industry. We want to get insurers and brokers to do things better. We're not a disruptor in that sense, um, but I do think that in the wider ecosystem, you see both enablers and disruptors. Big part of that is the Insect London ecosystem. I can't uh, thank you enough for all the great work of being putting together and bringing the awareness and bringing people to be able, and we're proud to be a supporter. Um, as I told Robin on the third anniversary of, of uh, Digital Fine Print, DFP would not be here if it wasn't for Instant London. It just had to have that fertile soil to be able to grow up into. And now we're trying to do our part to bring others into the ecosystem as well. Well, thank you very much for your support. And, and that is very much part of our model, which is to sort of pay forward you know, people in their first couple of years, generally first couple of years, get it for free. And then uh, as with you, you very kindly come back and support and put something back into the community. And that allows us to, to grow next. So thank you very much. And At very I'm, reasonable rates, which I recommend everybody to be paying. So that's fine. <laughs> And it might also be intriguing at some point to go back and look at some of your early pictures and see how see how things have evolved since then. But no, that's tremendous. Thank you very much. People, if anyone does want to get hold of you, for, you've mentioned various different areas there that you're interested in, what's the best way to contact you? Eric at digitalfineprint.com or just use the contact form on the website. Great, and we'll put those details in the episode notes as well. Eric, thank you very much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure talking to Eric, and I do encourage you to find out more about the company. Now, as you've gathered, we don't just do podcasts at Insect London. We have a regular series of evening events, breakfasts and dinners. So check us out on the website and come along to see what gets Eric and others so excited about these. Also, do take a look at the great content we've got on the website. We've just launched our search bar so you can check it out to see what we've been doing with companies big and small. And of course, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter if you want to know what's going on and what we think you'll find interesting every week.